nice to see everybody. Great to be able to meet together and to worship God. Let me pray as we open and then we'll sing our first hymn. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for being with us this last week and all the different things that we've been through. And we thank you, Lord, that we're found in your presence this morning. We pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit that you will help us to worship you. Help us to learn from your word, the Bible. Help us, Lord, to become more like the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, stand for able and sing our first hymn this morning. Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes. Let's stand and sing together. Israel. 
Can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck it up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. Now, therefore, Say to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return, every one from his evil way, and mend your ways and your deeds. Amen. Let's continue to worship God. Just pray, shall we, this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, we thank you for the Bible, and Lord, when we read it sometimes we struggle, often we struggle because it's hard and difficult to understand what you're saying to us and speaking to us through your word. So we pray for the help of your Holy Spirit this morning, Father, to, to give us enlightenment into your word, to help us to understand your word, Lord, to, to drive it home in our hearts and in our minds what it is you want to say to us this morning. So we thank you, Father. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for your Holy Spirit as he works in our lives. We thank you most of all for your Son. And Lord, we thank you for his, his great love for us and his great sacrifice on our behalf. And so, Father, we do come before you this morning. We pray for those who are here, for those who are away, Lord, for those who are suffering, those who are unwell, Lord, those who are in pain. We just pray that you will bring comfort. Lord, for those who are mourning, we pray, Lord, that you will be to them everything that they need. And Father, we, we pray for the land in which we live. We thank you for uh, the news we've had of camps and the work, work that you're doing in the lives of young people. And we pray, Lord, that that will continue, that um, all the camps that have been going on this summer will be used for your glory. And there will be many um, young people coming to know the Lord Jesus and, and going on with him, we pray. Lord, we pray too for the, the conflicts in our world. We continue to remember Ukraine and Russia and what's happening there. Pray for your churches there. Your churches, they seek to, to reach out and bring aid and to bring the gospel. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you'll protect them and that your name will be lifted high, even in the midst of such death and destruction. Pray for our, our land too here. We think of the upheaval in politics and all that's going on there. And again, Lord, we thank you that you are sovereign that you are in ultimate control and that we can have confidence in you for our futures. And so Lord, we do pray and commit our land to you. And Father, as we, we come this morning, we just pray that you will help us. Help us to really get into your word, that we will grow in faith, mature in the gospel, we pray, for your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Before we come to the, the sermon, we're going to stand and sing our next hymn, Immortal, Invisible God, Only Wise. Let's sing together.
there's a, I think it's on BBC, there's a TV program that, uh, we, well, I say we watch. I, I'm not an avid watcher. I think my wife watches it more than I do. And it's called, Who Do You Think You Are? I don't know whether you've seen the program, Who Do You Think You Are? Basically, and let me tell you, it's been on the BBC since 20, 2004. Okay, so it's quite getting on a bit. And what it does, it takes celebrities, tends to be celebrities, famous people, and it takes them through their, their family tree. And it takes them back. You know, they say, oh, you know, I don't know what happened then. I'd like to find out about my great, 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 great grandparents. And so they get all these experts and they take them back through their family tree. And it's interesting. I, I, I googled the, the top, what's, what was the top episode of Who Do You Think You Are? And I was surprised by the answer. Um, I don't think I've seen it. My wife may have seen it. And it's one about Sir Matthew Pinson. I don't know if you know Matthew Pinson. He was the Olympic rower. Okay, there was him and his friend Red Grave, Red Mark, Red Grave, and they won loads of gold medals rowing. That's what he's famous for, rowing. Huge man, big muscle. And he rowed, and I think he won about five or six gold medals, went to lots and lots of Olympic Games. And, and they researched his family tree. And his, they traced it back, let me get this right, to Catherine Howard, Anybody know who Catherine Howard is? I won't test you. I'm getting a few nods. Okay. She was the fifth wife of Henry the Eighth. Get my Roman numerals right then. Henry the Eighth. So he's a direct descendant of her royalty. He's royalty. And that was like a big, oh, great. There's been a few others since that have had something similar. Really impressive stuff. But not only to Henry VIII, they, they took it back to, to Edward I and then to William the Conqueror. Wow, fancy being able to tra trace your family tree back to William the Conqueror. Was that 1066? But then they, undis they discovered an even more shocking discovery. Can you, can you discover a shocking discovery? Yes, I think you probably can. Uh, and they found an ancient scroll, okay, which stated that the, the Norman king, look at this, was descended from Adam and Eve, from Adam and Eve. So in effect, they've said, so Matthew Pinson, we can trace your family tree back to Adam and Eve. That's what they were saying. <gasps> wow, shock, horror, gasp. Who do you think you are? If you were to ask me this morning, who do I think I am? Well, our claim to fame, and uh, one of my sisters reminded me this week by uh, posting, oh, she, she shared something on Facebook. Um, whether it's a good thing or not, we don't know, but we like to think it's true that we're related to um, Morgan the Pirate, you know, of oldie days fame. Came from a little town, little spit, uh, village in South Wales, Lam Rumney, where our family was from, the Morgans. So we like to claim that we're related to pirates. But who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? In the passage that I read this morning, that question, who do you think you are, just floats around in the background. And it's a question, actually, that, that can be asked in a couple of ways. You know, there's a friendly way of asking who do you think you are, and there's that, that challenging way when somebody cuts up in your face and who do you think you are? can be asked as a challenge. But in the passage, in Jeremiah chapter 18, actually it's asked in a challenging way. And it's asked in two, in sort of two ways, of two groups, if you like, if I can use that term. The first is this, who does God think he is? Who does God think he is? And as we read the passage, it gives us the answer. He is the potter who molds and shapes us after his will. But then there's a, there's a second question. That question's asked a second time. Who does Israel, who does God's people think that they are? And the answer that we're given, they are the, the pot who think that they can resist 
the will of the potter. And, and, and right here in, in this passage, we have such a powerful example of the contest of wills, if you like, at the very center of human history. I'm referring, of course, to the, the contest between the sovereign God, who rules heaven and earth, and sovereign self, who came into being when, we've already spoken about Adam and Eve, first bit on the tantalizing promise that they would be like God, knowing good from evil in Genesis 3. And Jeremiah 18 gives us unique insights into the mystery and actually the tragedy of that contest. So Jeremiah. Jeremiah had been given a, a grim mission. Like, no one likes grim missions, do they? You see, Jeremiah found himself addressing a nation, he was a prophet, who were hurtling headlong toward judgment from God. That's the road that they were on. They were told, carry on doing what you're doing, and God will judge. You'll come under God's judgment. The Israelites may well have feared the future as all those outside superpowers around them drew near, but rather than responding with, with humility, yes, and repentance towards God, the people of Judah just like turned in on themselves, became islands, disregarding God's commandments disregarding the increasing danger that resulted from their disobedience. So, so God called Jeremiah. And he called Jeremiah to proclaim, to announce doom to Judah. I don't think I'd like that job. But the ultimate, the ultimate aim of that, that gloomy message is actually repentance. And so far, Israel hadn't responded to Jeremiah's words. We're in, remember, we're in chapter 18. I've not read the first 17 chapters to you. So there's been quite a lot going on. And they've continued to ignore Jeremiah's words. Actually, not only ignore in the next few verses and, and chapters, the readers of Judah, they plot to kill Jeremiah. And here in chapter 18, because of what's been going on, God gives Jeremiah uh, an object lesson to, to tell, to show to the people of, of Judah. It's designed to, to convince them to pay attention and repent. And actually, I say it's a, it's a, it's a tradition that, that Jesus would continue. See, God uses a, an ordinary everyday part of, albeit ancient life for them, to drive home an extraordinary message. We get that. Jesus does that, doesn't he, with his parables. He takes, takes something that he can see people doing and, I say, he puts a, he puts a holy spin on it or, or uses it as a, as a teaching point. So what is that object lesson here? Well, in verse 2 of chapter 18, God tells Jeremiah just go down to the potter's house, you know, second one on the left. Just go down there, and, and I will let you hear my words. It's just a potter's house, just a normal potter they would have had in the village making pots, people. And at the potter's house, Jeremiah doesn't see, see anything out of the ordinary. In fact, he sees a really ordinary thing. He sees a potter working a piece of clay at the potter's wheel. I think there's a, there's a program on TV, isn't there? A series where they make things on a potter's wheel. So I have that picture. So he throws the clay onto the wheel and he forms it into a, a pot of some sort. Nothing, nothing crazy about that. Nothing special about that. And, and when the pot turned into something the potter hadn't intended because there was some flaw in, in the clay, what happens? Potter just starts all over again. Puts it back into a ball, throws it back on the wheel. 
and then, and then forms the, the clay into another pot, shaping it here, as it's, the Bible tells us, as it seems best to him. Wow. Don't think there's anything more ordinary than that, especially in their day and age. The message is simple. The potter, just think about it, the potter has absolutely absolute control over that lump of clay. Simple, isn't it? You know, if, if, if the lump of clay had been thrown onto the wheel and no potter, it could just stay as a lump of clay. It couldn't form itself into a pot. No, the potter has absolute control over that lump of clay. He can do with it whatever seems best to him on the day. Tall pot, small pot, wide pot, whatever it is. Absolute control. So far, so good? Everyone knows that's true, isn't it? There's no argument about that. It's obvious. Why are you even talking about it? You could ask. But then the word of God comes to, to Jeremiah in verse 6. So remember, this is the picture that he's just seen. And then in verse 6, the word of God comes to Jeremiah and he says this. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. O house of Israel. Oh, wow. That's changing things a bit now, isn't it? God's saying that he has absolute control over the house of Israel, over people. God is asserting his complete sovereignty over Israel. He can do whatever he see, seems best to him with the clay that is his people. I suggest that that's not a popular message today. I think there'll be lots of people who would feel aggrieved at that this morning, that God is absolutely sovereign. In a day when, when many people feel free to challenge God or to argue with God or become angry with God or, or just generally treat God as, as an equal and, and less than he actually is, a message like this will be rejected out of hand. It brings back all those old images of, of God as, a, as an angry tyrant, you know, just sitting there with his, his finger on, ready just to press the smite button and to get you. Most people wouldn't welcome a, a sermon on a text like this unless you preach it as God intended. And what do I mean by that? I'll say it this way. Because the picture here is not that of a, of a tyrant who's eager to destroy. That's not the picture. That's not what God's saying. Rather of a, of a potter who's eager to start over with a, with a flat, flat, fatally flawed piece of clay. This is an aspect of God's sovereignty we don't usually consider. Not absolute erratic control, but gracious willingness, in effect, to change his plan to benefit his flawed people. And when God discovers this, this fatal flaw in his people, he doesn't simply destroy them. He offers to start over with them. What he ends up doing will be determined by how his people respond to his announcement of doom. And that actually, if you want, is the really puzzling piece of our text this morning. After unequivocally announcing that he has complete control over his people, God introduces the idea of, of conditionality to the relationship between himself and Israel. Four times, God uses the word if in verses 7 to 10. Four times. The sovereign Lord promises that if his people will change their behavior, he will change his plans. Isn't that crazy, isn't it? 
So the, the sovereign plan of God is, is, is what? Is, is malleable, is, is conditional, is, is uncertain. This, this kind of talk seems so confusing to us, doesn't it? Further, what, what do we make of this talk about God changing God's mind in verse 8, where it says, I will relent and not inflict the disaster. I will reconsider the good I intended to do to it. Wait a minute, you say, isn't, isn't God unchangeable? Isn't that the heart of the, the classic simplicity doctrine? If, if God knows all, simply, why then would God have to change if he knows what's going to happen? Wouldn't God simply include the right conditions in his plan? Then God would appear to relent, to reconsider So that is simply God accommodating himself to our infantile understanding. If you want to think more about that, you can look up Calvin's yeah, famous accommodation doctrine, that God simplifies things that we can understand. But God doesn't change God's mind or plan. That's, that's set from all eternity. And yet, and yet this text seems to say that Israel's destiny is in its own hands. Here are my plans, says God, but if you change your behavior, I will change my plans. Does this mean that, that actually humans are ultimately sovereign and that the pot is in charge of its own life? I think there are certainly scholars who, who would draw that conclusion but what I think is happening is that in his sovereignty, God has given humans a, a frightening, maybe a heartening role in God's plan. Because we're not in inanimate, senseless pieces of clay. We are made in God's image with a mind and with a will and with an ability to affect our relationship with God. Does God cede control to us? Not at all. But in his loving control, he gives us an important role to play in the outworking of his plan. Is your mind getting blown? It seems really hard, and it is hard. It's complex, isn't it? But, but that's the reality that runs through the Bible. God, God wants, God commands, God, God invites our obedience in faith. That is the message to Israel. He says, you are mine and I expect you to love me, to obey me, to trust me. And when you don't, you're playing with fire, with darkness, with death. I can destroy you, God says, but that's not what I want. I want, want you to turn around and to come back to me. I will do everything I can to bring you back. But you have to choose to come back. If you do make that choice, I will not do what I said I will do, God says. Instead, I will do what I've wanted to do all along, namely to bless you and to build you up, to plant you, to save you. God ends all this, this complex, we, we might say confusing talk, actually with a, with a simple, direct, and actually a devastating warning in verse 11. Look, God speaking, look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. Wow. What would you do if God spoke that directly to you right here, right now? I've been patient with you long enough. Now the end has come. Prepare to make your, meet your maker, the potter. There is no more chance for you to turn around and to repent and come to me. That would be absolutely devastating. Devastating to us. But that's not where God leaves things, thankfully, here. Instead of ending 
his warning with a, an ex exclamation point of, of anger, God actually ends with another invitation. Verse 11, he finishes like this. Return. Return every one from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. God truly is what he announced himself to be in that amazing, important revelation all the way in, in, in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. This is what he says there. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping his steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. That, that text goes on to say, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And that's where Israel is right now in this part, in this book of Jeremiah. They're guilty. They're guilty. They're guilty of everything that God has accused them of. But not just guilty, they are totally unrepentant. I didn't read it, but that's the point of verse 12. All the ifs of verses 7 to 10 all the, the promises of God relenting and reconsidering, all the possibilities of new life, all of that is actually a moot point because Israel are stuck in their sin. But they will say, this is in vain. Or in the NIV, it's no use. Sounds like an expression, doesn't it, of defiance. Doesn't matter what you say or do, God. Or maybe it's an expression of despair. We've just gone too far to turn back. But the result is the same. The same, we will pursue our plans no matter what God, <clears throat> excuse me, what God has planned. That, that ancient struggle of wills goes on and on because our hearts are evil and stubborn. Oh, God may claim to be sovereign. Oh, but in fact, we are. So we shake our fists at God. And that's what rebellion against God really is. Who could blame God for finally ending it with Israel? Except God doesn't. He doesn't end it. Not completely. Oh, oh there was terrible punishment but it lasted, I want to say, only 70 years. And even after that, however, the, the struggle continued until God did a shocking thing. In, in an act as dramatic as shaping humanity from clay, from soil, from earth, all the way back in the beginning of Genesis 2, God sent his son to become a lump of clay. What about that in John, when we're looking at John chapter 1? so that those who believe in him could have a whole new beginning. Or as the Bible puts it, the right to be called to become children of God. That, that son, thrust into the age-old struggle of the wills, submitted himself to the will of the Father, and actually to the will of evil men. Yet this whole matter of the will of God and the will of man remains a mysterious matter. But because of Christ, there are some things we do know. We know definitively that the will of God for us sinners is better than our own, than our own willful plans. Knowing that, we can trust God in Christ. Paul writing to the Romans, 
in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 said this. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? That's God's will for us. That's God's will, that we turn to the Lord Jesus in repentance and faith. And because he didn't spare his son, will he not also give us, graciously give us all things? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Let's sing, shall we, our last hymn this morning. Come, people of the risen King, let's stand and sing together. Father, we thank you that you are sovereign. And Lord, we, we don't pretend to understand what that means in its entirety, but we thank you that you are God. And we are not. And we thank you, Lord, that you hear our cries, you hear our despair, and you, you sent us the Lord Jesus so we can now live as your children. And we thank you, Lord, that you don't treat us as our sins deserve, but you have laid on your Son your wrath at our sin. And you've forgiven us. Help us, Lord. Help us to live for you in all that we do.